passage of scripture sound familiar? <laughs> it might be that some of you are thinking right now, boy, Bill's got a lot of courage to pre preach a lesson from the same passage that Brother Ken Fields presented a lesson just two weeks ago, and such an excellent job that he did uh, in presenting that lesson. But uh, actually, hearing what he had to say spawned uh, another thought concerning the text there that I wanted to present this morning. But before we get into the lesson, well, to uh, Brother Mark reminded me that there are a couple of things that need to be announced. One <clears throat> is concerning the hurricane that is fastly approaching. We've got brothers and sisters in Christ. Mark's uh, son is there uh, somewhat in the path, and also it's going, they think, probably hit in the Carolinas. We've got brethren there, too. But let us uh, be mindful of those who are in the path of that hurricane. It has been... Uh, uh, rated a class five uh, category uh, hurricane, which I think is the highest category there is. So the winds are ferocious, and uh, a lot of devastation and destruction can be done by that. Hopefully there will not be uh, lives lost, but please keep all the people in that area, but especially your brothers and sisters in Christ. And also uh, we want to announce that Brother Ken Fields, for those of you who did not see it on Facebook. <coughs> Brother Ken Fields had surgery on his neck, on his throat recently. He's re uh, recovering well. Uh, but uh, just keep Ken in your prayers as well. Ken did indeed present an exceptionally fine lesson from the text that we are taking this morning. But that lesson focused primarily on the sun. And he pointed out that the 15th chapter of Luke was actually a series of parables that Jesus spake in regard to that which was lost and then that which was found. And he presented the lesson from this text concerning the, the younger of the two sons of this man who demanded his inheritance be given to him. He went into a foreign country. He squandered it. He, he wasted it, he began to be in want, and he decided that he needed to come back home. And he made the journey home, and the boy who, uh, who left uh, came back. The boy who was lost had been found. And it was an excellent, excellent lesson. But Ken also pointed out in that lesson that really the parables here in Luke chapter 15, particularly the parable of the prodigal son, is really about God. Uh, we a lot of times focus on the prodigal son. Sometimes we focus on the elder son and his very poor attitude and everything. But really this, this passage of scripture is truly about God. I want us to look at this statement here, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. And I'd like to, for you to answer this question. And that is, what picture of God comes to your mind when you read those words? What picture of God comes to your mind when we read, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him? The picture that came to my mind was that of the longing of the father. How much he desperately wanted his son to come home. The fact that it says that while he was still a long way off, his father saw him indicates that the father was looking for him every single day. I really like the way that Brother D. Bowen uh, comments concerning that particular statement. He said the father was watching for him every single day, and he didn't know when the bus was coming in. And I think that that's a good way to focus our minds on the fact that the father was ever looking, waiting, longing, desiring for his son to come home, so much so that he was out there every single day looking for him. We're told in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who would have all men to be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth. I see in this statement here, I see the God who longs for my salvation. I see the God who longs, believe it or not, to have me, to have you by his side, in his presence, in eternity. A God that wants us to come home to him so desperately bad that he would give his own son to die on the cross, to pay the ransom price for our sins, 
Yes, for the sin of the world, according to John chapter 1 and verse 29, behold, the Lamb of God takes away the sin of the world. Proper grammar says that when you're taking a multitude of things and making it all lump it into one, it's the singular sin because you've made it all into one. Jesus, the scriptures say, was called the Lamb of God who takes away the sin, all the sin. He made the, uh, the price. He paid the ransom price for all the sin for all time. And that tells us just how much God wants us with him. But there is also this statement, quickly bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fattened calf, kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. Now, what picture do you get of God from those words? And the picture that I get when I read those words is that the happiness of the father. The moment that he saw his son, and so, so joyous was he, so glad was he, that he didn't wait for his son to come to where he was. He ran, the scriptures say, to tell uh, to, uh, to, to his son. And he embraced him, and, 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 it, and he told his, uh, his servants to bring out the robe and put it on him, a ring on his hand, sandals on his feet, kill the fattened calf, we're going to eat it, and we're going to celebrate because this son of mine has come home. A week ago tomorrow, Jean and I went over to Joliet to meet my sister Mary Jo at the train station. She was coming up from, from Texas to spend quite a bit of time with me. And I can tell you that we got there in plenty of time, actually got there faster than what we actually needed to because there was a little bit of a delay. They needed to put on an extra car uh, for the number of people that were going to be coming on up toward Chicago. So uh, she didn't get in at the, at the time that we expected, but we didn't care. We were there. We were talking about this, that, and the other. But I want to tell you something. When that train pulled in, and Gene and I, as the train pulled in and came to a stop, we left the waiting area that we, that we were in, and we went out, uh, out there where people were going to be getting off the train, and I think Mary Jo must have been anxious to be here because she was the first one off the, bus, uh, the young, off the train. But we ran to her, walked fast. I don't really run much anymore. But we got to her as fast as we possibly could. We hugged and kissed her. Uh, we were so happy to see her. And you know what we did? We went out and ate. <laughs> like we were supposed to do. We went to the Golden Corral and had a very nice meal in our celebration of uh, my sister getting here uh, safe and sound. Yes, I see in this account here the God of my salvation, how desperately he wants me to be with him. How desperately he wants me to cling to him. How desperately he wants me to walk in the light of his word so that we can have fellowship with one another now. Even here upon this earth, but then to come home to him so that we can have fellowship with him forever and ever and ever and ever. And I can see in this parable the joy that it brings God when someone turns away from sin, turns away from following Satan, and turns to the living God in repentance, put his son Jesus on in the waters of baptism, has their soul cleansed of all its sin, of all the dross, of all those nasty, ugly, reviling things to God, and it is cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ and reconciled unto God, being at peace with him, and it makes our God happy. And so this morning I want us to look at this question right here. Do you make God happy each day? And let's, let's draw it a little bit closer right now, more immediately. Has your worship that you offered to God this morning, do you think he made, it, it made him happy? Did you worship him in spirit and in truth? And I know that sometimes that's a difficult thing when we get together every week to come together to worship God. And, and we do a number of things that we do every single week. And sometimes when you do something on such a repetitive basis, it becomes somewhat uh, just taken for granted almost. It's easy to do that. One of the reasons why I choose to pray to the Father all during the observance of the Lord's Supper, it helps me concentrate on that great sacrifice that was made for me by Jesus Christ so long ago. Was your worship to God this morning such that it put a smile 
on the Father's face. Let's look at some things that we can do that will help us to make God happy every single day. Let's begin by the fact that we, if we take notice of the beauty of God's creation each day, we certainly will make him happy. This is actually a picture that I got, got off of Google Images, but I was really surprised to see this because two weeks ago when Gene and I were returning from uh, Indianapolis, we were coming to, uh, and nearing to Hammond uh, uh, just about the time that the sun was going down and over in the west, there was a sunset that looked so very much like this. I took a couple of pictures on my phone. I stopped at a red light, but I took a couple of pictures on my phone. Uh, and Gene said, well, you know good and well that that's not going to even come close to catch, uh, capturing the beauty of this sunset. I have to tell you, it was perhaps one of the most spectacular sunsets I have ever seen in my life. And it just seemingly lasted, uh, it was over an hour that we got to enjoy it because we were still about an hour out from uh, homeland uh, when we started noticing this sunset. But it looked so very much like this. There was so much color in the sky. There were so many different kinds of clouds different shapes of clouds, different colors in the clouds, and it just reminded us of the greatness of God, the greatness of his creation. And I think that that's exactly what God wants us to do, and I think that it makes him very happy when we take time to notice the beauties of his creation. We're told in Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, God saw that all he had made, and behold, it was very good. And I don't know about you, but in that particular verse, I see the smile on God's face. He completed his, his creation, and he looked at it. He looked at every bit of it, including Adam and Eve. He looked at the animals. He looked at the stars in the sky. He looked at the beauties uh, of this earth, the, the, the mountains and, and the green hills and trees and flowers and everything that he had put together to make this creation for us. And I just see God smiling real big, and he says, you know what? I did good. I did good there. And I think that that is emphasized, believe it or not, from a, from a negative perspective. Because you remember that Eve was deceived by Satan. She ate of the forbidden fruit, gave to her husband, and he ate thereof too. God came and called them out, wanted to know where you were. And then when he found out what had, had happened, that is to say when he had uh, confronted them about that. He says to Eve, what is this you have done? And I see that incredible smile that God had on his face at the conclusion of his creation when he said, it is very good. And now he's got tears coming from his eyes because now that perfect creation had been ruined. And he even pronounced a curse on his creation because of the sin mm -hmm. of mankind. We have that ability, don't we? We have that ability to make God smile every single day, and we have that ability to bring tears to his eyes, if you will. Jesus, while he was upon this earth on various occasions, cried. And we're told about how that he wept at the, at the death of Lazarus when he went to raise him from the dead. There were tears coming down from our Savior's eyes. And we know that we can. We can hurt God. We can make him sad with, our, with the way that we live. But we want to please God. We want to make him happy. We read there in Job chapter 7, uh, 37 verse 14. Listen to this, O Job. Stand and consider the wonders of God. In other words, I believe that God is telling us in that verse of scripture right there. Listen, I know you've got a busy day. I know that you've got a lot of things on your plate. But what I really would like for you to do, if you want to make me happy, if you want to pull a smile and put a smile on my face, I tell you what, just stand and consider the wonders of my creation. And the psalmist tells us the same thing. Be still and know I am God. And if we will do that, we will make him happy. We're told in the 19th Psalm, the heavens are telling of the glory of God and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. And then also we see that in Job chapter 38 and verse 7, we're told that the morning star sing. If God's creation is declaring his greatness, his glory, his majesty, because the stars sing as they're moving along their pathways, uh, we're t and maybe even that might be poetic language. Who cares? Basically speaking, what God is saying, my creation reminds me 
that in the beginning, it was perfect. It was everything I wanted it to be. And he wants us to at least see, isn't it amazing, though, that this world that we live in is so beautiful. If you travel to any degree at all, you will see marvelous, marvelous sights that you can take pictures of it if you want to, but it's not going to do justice to the beauties of God's creation. Even in the state that it is in, and that is in the fallen, broken state, this world is broken. We don't even have that perfect, that perfect creation of God to look at. And yet, in its broken state, look how beautiful it still is for us to enjoy. Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these stars, the one who leads forth their host by number. He calls them all by name because of the greatness of his might and the strength of his power. Not one of them is missing. Right, have you noticed something here? How much God is saying, I want you to look. I gave you two eyes. And I want you to look with those two eyes. And I want you to see the wonders, the beauty. I want you to see my glory as it is demonstrated in my creation. Romans chapter 1 and verse 20. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. There it is again. Being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. Every one of these things point to the fact that God created heaven and earth and it was perfect and it gave him great, great joy. And it can still bring God great, great joy even though it's a broken creation if you and I will just take time to look at it, to enjoy it, and to be in all of it. I, I, you know, I have to honestly admit to you that I have a little bit of trouble standing in awe of God. I think all of us do. To be awed. I mean to be filled with such wonder that we're, we're speechless. But I want to tell you, Gene and I seeing that, 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 uh, that sunset two weeks ago, all we can say is, isn't that magnificent? Just over and over and over again, we just repeated how beautiful that sunset was. Every one of these passages of Scripture are telling us that God wants us to take time to look and to see and to be filled with awe at the greatness and the majesty of our God, the God who has created us and the God who loves us so very much. We can make God happy if we will pay attention to his creation. What a beautiful sight that is. Job chapter 12 and verses 7 through 10. But now ask the beast and let them teach you and the birds of the heavens and let them tell you. Oh, speak to the earth and let it teach you and let the fish of the sea declare to you who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this and whose hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. What God is telling us here as he spake with Job, is, you know what? My creation, my creation can speak to you if you'll let it. It can tell you of the wonders of God and how majestic, majestic he is, how great he is, how awesome he is, how wonderful he is. And I'd like for you to join with me in singing the first verse of How Great Thou Art. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the world thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. Magnificent God. So we can make God, if we'll talk to him, we'll make him real happy. If we'll take time to talk with him each day. Now I'm not talking, I'm not even talking about taking time when it's time for us to eat, to bow our heads and offer a word of thanksgiving for the food that we're about to eat. <coughs> I think God pretty much expects us to do that. But we can really make our God happy. I mean really happy if we'll spend more time with him every day talking with him. You know, every single relationship you can think of 
is pretty much based on proper communication. You cannot know someone if you don't talk with them and learn about them and they learn about you. You know what's the difference between a good, good friend and a total stranger? No communication. You don't really know anything about a stranger. It's an amazing thing when, when we talk to someone that we've never met before and we learn about them. We learn something about them and we learn to at least appreciate something about them. And now they're no, long, they're no longer a stranger, are they? They might not be our best friend, but they're someone that we know something about. Communication is absolutely necessary in order for us to be pleasing and to make God happy. We're told in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18, rejoice always, pray without ceasing. God is telling us, I want to hear from you. I, I want to talk with you. I want you to talk with me in prayer. And I'd like for you to turn around and get my book out and let me talk to you. Because this is the way that God talks to us. God wants us to communicate with him, and he wants to communicate with us. That's the reason why he gave us this book that we call the Bible. Pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. It's a passage of scripture that sometimes we don't pay a whole lot of attention to in this way. But in Micah 6, my people, what have I done to you, and how have I wearied you? You know, sometimes I can't help but wonder if, our attitudes and maybe our casual attitudes toward God, uh, toward our worship to God. I wonder if God is wondering, why have I, what have I done to make you so weary that you can't worship me no, no better than that? To give me your heart, to give me your soul, to pour out your heart and worship to me. When I, when I, when I have you the, sing praises to me, open your mouth and let it out. A joyful noise, God calls it. He's telling us, I don't care if you can carry a tune in the toe sack. I want to hear you. I want to hear you sing. I want to hear you sing out in praise to me because I deserve your praise. And so God tells us, what have I, what have I done to worry you? I brought you up and ransomed you from the house of slavery. Now that was God's people Israel being delivered out of Egyptian slavery. But through Jesus Christ, those of us who are members of the body of Christ, his church, have been ransomed and have been free from the slavery of sin and Satan. And so this is just as much appropriate for you and me today as it was for God's people Israel then. He says, remember now so that you might know the righteous acts of the Lord. God wants us to talk with him. He wants us to communicate with him and he wants us to tell him all about what we're feeling, all about what we're experiencing. He wants us to talk with him, and he wants us to communicate with him our cares, our troubles, our fears, so that he can allay all of those things, so that he can, he can take all of those things away from us. We need to talk with God every single day, several times. Our Lord and Savior, we're, supp we're supposed to follow his example, right? He prayed all the time. He spent entire evenings, all night in prayer with the Father in heaven. He communicated with his Father while he was here on this earth. And he gave us that example to pray without ceasing. Join with me as we sing, Did You Think to Pray? Ere you left your room this morning, did you think to pray? In the name of Christ our Savior, Continue investigating how we can make God happy. Put a smile on his face. Oh, by needing him. We need to lead, to need God. A few years ago, city buses in Chicago had a big sign on the side of them. 
And that sign said, I got along just fine today without God. It were those people who did not want to worship God, didn't want anybody else to worship him either. And so they were trying to convince people, you don't need God. You're doing okay, right? Everybody's doing okay, basically. Maybe some's got more than others, but we're okay without God. No, no, we're not. We need God, and we need God all the time. I'd like for us to sing a couple of verses of I Need Thee Every Hour this morning. I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord. No tender voice like thine can be support. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee, oh, bless thee now, my Savior. verse of scripture. My favorite in the book of Job, you know this, I've said it many, many times, Job chapter 38, verses 25 and 26, who has cleft a channel for the flood or a way for the thunderbolt to bring rain on a land without people, on a desert without a man in it? I love that passage of scripture so very, very much because what God is telling Job is, listen, Job, I know I've seen in your heart that you're wondering, where am I when you need me? But I want to tell you something, Job. I take awareness of all of my creation. There's places upon this earth that there's not a, a, a man, not a human living, a, a human being living anywhere close by. But you know what I do? I send rain in that area when I need to because there are things alive there. And they need the rain. And it doesn't, it doesn't mean that I have to have some human being created in my likeness after my, you know, in the fashion of me, that I am taking awareness of it. I take awareness of all of my creation. And you know what? Jesus, Jesus agreed with that. He told his apostles as he was sending them out to preach the gospel of the kingdom. He said, your very hairs of your head are all numbered. All he was wanting them to do is don't be scared. Don't be frightened. I'm with you. No matter where you are, I'm with you. And the Father in the heavens are with you. And he knows everything that's going on in your life. And that's exactly what Job was, uh, was saying there, what God was telling Job. Here was a man who was covered in sores. He was just miserable. And he wondered because the friends who came to supposedly help him just compounded his sorrow and, his and, and, and the pain that he was feeling because they kept accusing him of being a great sinner and Job knew that wasn't right. And he asked, oh, he pleaded that there would be a mediator for him between he and God. Well, we have that mediator in Jesus Christ. But he was wondering, where is God? I need him so much. Well, God told him, he says, I'm here. I'm everywhere. There's not even some, some plants or whatever it might be way out in the desert someplace. I know all about them. And I know when they need the rain, and I send it to them. Acts chapter 17, verse 28. <coughs> the apostle Paul, there at Athens, he said, He is Lord of heaven and earth. He does not dwell in tw temples made with hands, for he is, uh, nor is he served by human hands as though... He needed anything since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. For in him we live and move and exist. And we need to let God know every single day. Not only in prayer, but in our hearts, in our minds. We need to let God know, I need you. I need you every hour. Because even the breath of life comes from you. And I would be nothing and could have nothing without you. 
We're told in the 23rd Psalm, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Isn't it a, a strange thing? But people like those who had that sign on the bus, I got along just fine without God today. But isn't it an interesting thing that pretty much almost everybody, when they come to that last few moments of their life on their deathbed, and all of a sudden, whether they verbalize it or not, in their hearts, they know they need this God who gave them the breath of life. We can deny it if we want to. We can live as if we're denying it if we want to. But we need God even for the life that we have been given. And it is a precious life. And we need to thank God for it and thank, for his, thank Him for His provisions. And that brings us to, do you thank God each day? Because God wants us to thank Him. I think I have told you before that when I was a youngster growing up, Mary Jo can verify this, when I was a youngster growing up, if you got a gift from somebody and you didn't think to say thank you on your own accord, there was Mama there, give it back. Give it back. If you can't be grateful for what you're given, then give it back. What if God dealt with us that way? What if God dealt with us that way yesterday? Did you spend time? And I, I think about this because I'm thinking about yesterday and I'm not, I think I'm preaching to myself here, sadly. But I know I don't spend enough time in prayer to God thanking Him. I know we sing the song, Count Your Blessings, but that's an impossibility. You cannot count the blessings that God bestows upon us. They're just far too numerous. But we can try. We can be mindful of the blessings that we have each day. And we can on a regular basis stop what we're doing. Let us not ever get so busy with our daily lives that we cannot stop and tell God, thank you. Thank you for what you have done for me today. We're told in Romans chapter 5, verses 6, and, uh, 6 through 8, for while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I believe with all my heart that if there's anything that I should be grateful for, it's the love of God who would send his son Jesus, send him to die on the cross so that he could forgive me of my sins. I don't know that we think about, I know that I don't think enough about God's sacrifice. I think that God tried to help us appreciate that when he, when he told Abraham to go and offer Isaac, his only son, the son that you love, he said. Take him and offer him as a sacrifice. I'll show you where. I'll tell you when you get there. We see in that picture, the picture of God. How much he desperately loves us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. And so since God loves us so much that while we were yet sinners and even after obeying the gospel, we are still unworthy to receive the wondrous grace of God. And again, let me just emphasize one more time to help us to appreciate and be thankful to God for his salvation. After we've done everything that God told us that we have to do, after we've exercised faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, after we've made confession of faith in him, with our mouths after we have repented in sin and with a contract heart determined to turn away from sin, confessing Christ that he's going to be the Lord and master of my life after being baptized in water. We're saved by grace. We're saved by grace. And without the grace of God, we, get, we do not. Anybody does not get to heaven. Period. Plain and simple as that. Does that not does that not strike you as something to be grateful for? I think of that publican that went up to pray with the Pharisee. And the Pharisee just stood over there and says that he prayed to himself, and that's exactly what he was doing because he was extolling his great virtues. But the publican over there, so humble and meek in spirit, 
would not even look toward heaven, but smote his breast and said, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. He made it personal. Not a sinner, but the sinner. I pray that pretty frequently myself. Be merciful to me, <coughs> the sinner. And knowing that God is faithful to forgive us our sins when we meet his terms of pardon, we should always say thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your long-suffering. Thank you for your patience with me. Thank you for Jesus Christ who died for me. In a moment, we're going to sing the song of invitation. I just want to remind those who are here who've never obeyed the gospel, who have never let Jesus Christ wash your sin away. That we're told in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 2, he says, At the acceptable time, I listened to you, and on the day of salvation I helped you. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And we're going to sing a song of invitation here in just a minute. And I hope that everyone who is here, if you've not obeyed the gospel, I'm praying, if you stand accountable before God, please, please let him save you through the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. If you're a Christian and you're here, but you're not walking with God as you should, you're not living as you should, you're not making God happy as he deserves, take the opportunity to work things out with him. If a public confession of sin is necessary, then make that confession of sin. Have the courage, have the love for God enough to make that public confession of sin. But whatever your spiritual need might be this morning, we trust that you will take care of that right now while together we stand and sing this song.